so the title of my talk is Bug Bounties, the OWASP Top 10 Messy Bones and Real Lessons. Um, so essentially, uh, I'm Justice Cassell. This brief, brief, a uh, little bit of information about me. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that since we're already a little bit behind. Um, but yeah, I'm a security. Uh, do we? Well, I'm a security consultant for Cisco, um, so essentially um, penetration tester, but we work for companies on a case-to-case -case basis, right? Um, so these are some of the corporations that I've done work for um, outside of the normal Cisco day-to-day. -day. So talk breakdown. I'm assuming a majority of you are familiar with some of the things that I'm going to be covering, um, so some of it might be redundant. If it is, I'm sorry, but we're going to cover it as quickly as possible to make sure you guys aren't getting you know, repetitive information. Um, but essentially, what are bug bounties? So what are they, what do they do? Um, bug bounties is a service, which is gonna be, you know, how do they provide, what are the benefits, pros, the cons, the negatives, et cetera. Um, the OWASP top 10, I'm gonna go over that because I'm sure the majority are familiar with that. Um, bug bounties in the OWASP top 10, so how do they correlate? How can one benefit the other and how can we leverage the other, you know, vice versa to benefit um, both things involved. Um, lessons on patching and security. So I'll be taking practical examples and actual um, vulnerabilities, actual situations that I found myself in and using these public um, kind of databases of knowledge that we're able to get from using bug bounties and using these actual real life examples um, to take lessons home so that we can leverage not only in like our own security mindset, but uh, as you guys graduate or go work for different companies, you'll be able to take that as like a developer or whether you're red team, blue team, whatever you're doing, you'll be able to carry that mindset on and use it to better not only your testing ability, but your development ability as well. And um, yeah, so the final link would be bug bounties and the landscape of security, right? So. I'm gonna be discussing kind of um, my personal point of view as to how bug bounties have benefited and you know whether that's gonna, gonna end up being a benefit for security as a whole. And I'll be discussing kind of my personal experiences and kind of telling you guys um, from the heart, so to speak, um, the situation that I found myself in and, and how I think it's gonna change security as a whole. So, first and foremost, what is a bug bounty? As simple as form, it's an agreement between a corporation and a hacker or a security consultant or a penetration tester or a security researcher, whatever you want to call them. It's an agreement between the two to um, have a preset scope for an application, whether that's a hardware, mobile, web, anything along those lines, um, to have the authority and the authorization to test that application, develop any vulnerabilities for that, and work together to patch those. Um, there's a common framework for how these things work. Um, more often than not, there's a bug bounty site that serves as a middleman for these sorts of situations. And as a middleman, it benefits both the company and the independent researcher by you know, taking out all the superfluous extra stuff that doesn't really need to be there, doesn't really need to you know, have to be done every time on a per company, per hacker, per researcher basis. Um, and the corporation as that middleman kind of takes all of that out and it allows us to, you know, as a researcher, to come over and be like, hey, you know, I'd like to start doing some assessments for corporations. And the corporation it goes, hey, we need some researchers, um, and they don't have to sign you know, multiple agreements, things like that, it's all done for them. So essentially, findings go in, money comes out. Um, the way the bug bounty middlemen make money from this is from taking that flat fee. In addition to that, they take a cut of every single payout that is done. So say I find a vulnerability for $100, and that's what they deem it's worth. They pay me $100, the middleman gets 30, right? So they take a 30% cut of every payout. So highly lucrative for them, and we'll talk about how it's also lucrative for the company as well. So why are companies using bug bounty programs? It's easy to break it down, um, but first and foremost is eyes, right? So the way that things look and the way that things um, operate to each individual security research is gonna be different. All of us think differently, all of us test differently, um, all of us have different mindsets, all of us solve puzzles differently, and that's what security is in the nutshell, right? So by having multiple people looking at something, it's great, but for a company to be able to get access to hundreds, if not thousands of researchers at one time for a specific application or a specific suite of applications is invaluable, right? So just for simple statistics, if you're able to have a thousand people look at something for an hour or 10 guys look at it for an hour, a thousand people are gonna find or be more likely to find more vulnerabilities or more things that someone might have overlooked. So next is gonna be cost efficiency. Um, hugely efficient for corporations to be doing this. If the average security researcher, penetration tester, or whatever you want to call them, makes between seventy to say one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, combine that with benefits, you know, dental, four hundred one k, whatever it is, it's going to end up costing around two hundred k plus per individual they have on their security team. 
sure you can go that route, but for a corporation to have hundreds, if not thousands, again, of researchers looking at an application for that flat fee, and in certain cases, and certain middlemen um, run their sites differently, um, some of the situations where they don't actually have to pay, providing no vulnerabilities are found, it's free. So if a corporation registers, puts their site, puts their uh, all their information for the scope of the program up there, and no one finds anything, it's free. And in the event that they do find something, the odds of them having to pay out a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a head for how many vulnerabilities that are actually going to be received as valid, severe, and paid out, very very slim. So three is resource expenditure, um, which is broken down to time and manpower. And what I mean by that is, simply put. The amount of people that are on a red team or a security team within an actual organization um, is gonna be limited, right? And it's gonna be limited by their time. So while you're doing assessments, while you're doing you know, evaluations of applications within whatever corporation or company that you're actually doing work for, the issue with that is you're also gonna have you know, meetings, priority one events, other things that appear and come up that take you away from these assessments. And not only that, but there's a huge thing that happens that is, I'm gonna call it assessment fatigue, and if, say you work for a financial institution and you're assessing financial applications day in, day out. So these are gonna be the same applications built on more, more often than not the same frameworks with the same code, if not built by the same people, you're, it's gonna get old. You're not gonna be motivated, you're not gonna be driven, you're not gonna to want to you know, attack these applications as much because you're like, I've seen it every time, I've seen it every day, and you get lax, right? So not necessarily you won't put your heart into it, you won't you know, try your hardest, but more often than not, you're gonna kind of get into this, you know, flow of, you know, I look for these things. If it's not there, it's probably good. It's secure. I tried this. I didn't find any of these, and this is what we usually find, so it must be good. It happens when you have this amount of people looking at something with fresh eyes and with, you know, this is new to them, and they're excited, they're engaged. It's just much more efficient. So four is incentive and disincentive, and I really like this because I think it's one of the main things that bug bounties are, are doing. Um, so instead of, you know, great pay, you know, monetary incentive is fantastic, but it's also at the same time disincentivizing people who are on the fence or, you know, more towards that black hat side of things where, you know, sure, I can go sell this vulnerability for a couple thousand dollars to some random sketchy Russian people or some other stuff, you know, that's very valid, it's feasible, but then you have to go through the hassle of, albeit, sure, money laundering is easier now because of the internet and Bitcoin and all these things, right? But it's still a hassle. And if you don't live in a you know, country that tolerates these sorts of things like we do, then it's gonna be more, uh, you know, more headache for you. So it, it disincentivizes people from going out to these you know, third party organizations and less than reputable situations to sell these vulnerabilities and says, hey, you can make maybe less, but you can make some legitimate money, get, rep, you know, get a reputation, get a name for yourself at the same time. So I really like that portion of, of you know, what bug bounties are bringing. So, there's three different types of bug bounty programs. Most people are familiar with one, and that's public. Um, public, born, public bug bounty programs are simple, right? It's the ones that come out, a uh, corporation says, hey, we have these, this, this application, this web app, you know, a mobile application, these assets, this piece of hardware, these utilities, whatever it is. Feel free to attack these, find any vulnerabilities, submit it to us, and we'll pay you for it, right? Simply put. Now, that's what everybody's familiar with. There's a couple other tiers, right? So semi-private is more stringent, I would say. So semi-private is when a corporation reaches out to the bug bounty researchers themselves and goes, hey, you know, we've seen your name here, you have, you've built your reputation over here, we've seen your credentials, you've done work for company X on application Z, whatever it is, um, we want you, right? So they send out an invitation to the bug bounty researchers, they'll say, hey, we have a pool of 100, we want you to accept this, please attack this application for us, um, feel free, you know what I mean? So you can accept that. So semi-private, you know, adds a little bit of restrictions on that. Um, some of these require background checks, some of them require additional information, like they, they'll say, hey, we only want people from the United States, or we only want people from our, our home country, whatever it is, to assess this application. Now, that's great. Private kicks it up even higher than that, right? So private has all those stringent restrictions that semi-private has, but again, more secure and, and a little bit more in-depth. So private is something that the majority of the time, the researchers have actually applied for. So private has a written application, a practical exam, which means that you actually have to attack their own specific set of applications that they have to prove you're competent, to prove that you know what you're doing. There's usually a writing sample involved to show that you can produce high quality work um, consistently, right? And then there's also gonna be an interview. So the majority of the time they'll actually bring you out or call you, have a phone interview, a video interview to make sure you exist. 
Um, and then in addition to that, depending on the private bug bounty, um, there's been circumstances where I personally have had to go down to such and such government building. Um, you get fingerprinted, you get security clearance, you get you know polygraph tests, you get, you know, it's an in-depth process, right? So it gets a little extensive. But again, there's gonna be benefits and, and negatives to each of these, right? So again, private is more is top notch and very, 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 very you know stringent process. Semi-private is the invitation they reach out, and public is everyone free for all. So the main difference between all these is going to be quality and volume. So the issue with each of these tiers is that um, public's going to have you know the biggest sample set of people. There's tons of tons of people that can you know reach out and do this because it's free for everyone. Um, and as you go up, you're going to get less volume, but the quality is going to increase because not only have these people you know built a reputation, however they became qualified to become in, to get into the semi-private or the private, but they want to be there. They worked hard, they've, you know, they've done all these things, they've went through the, all the processes, you know, these, these are things that they wanted to do. Um, and that's great. The issue with the public that a lot of corporations see is that high volume of low quality reports. And what happens is you'll see people sitting at home and say, I, I find, you know, a vulnerability that has very little to no security impact. If I spam that vulnerability out to 400 different bug bounty programs, I might get $10 for you know half of those. It adds up, but it's obnoxious, right? So people don't like it. Corporations will ban you for doing these things, and it's bad for your reputation. But people will just make a new account and continue doing it. They'll sit at home with you know burp scanner running, app scan, web inspect, whatever it is, and submit whatever low findings that they can find. Um, it happens. So by having these tiers and these, you know, these checks and balances in place for these private to uh, semi-private bug bounties, um, corporations are able to, although they tend to cost a lot more, um, you're able to pick and choose you know, the sample set of what type of researcher you want to have access to your program. So what is OWASP? Simple, gonna kind of glaze over it. It's Open Web Application Security Project. It's a collective of individuals across the globe. They work together to develop you know, standards, industry standards for web applications, security, libraries, frameworks, code samples, um, all kinds of tools that help us as researchers, whether you're red team, blue team, again, developer, whatever it may be, Web OWASP has something for you and can help you. So the OWASP top 10 is, again, the industry standards checklist. Um, and I've been from company to company, and it kind of stays congruent. Um, the OWASP top 10 is leveraged as a, hey, if there's nothing on this list that matches as a vulnerability in this application, probably secure. Now that is a good and a bad thing, right? Because it could not be comprehensive. There could be something that doesn't match that mold. Um, but as OWASP has improved and the, as the top 10 has developed, um, the, the wording for that has gotten more and more generic and more generalized. Um, so by having that increase in generalization for the wording and overarching um, like concepts for, for how they phrase things, it kind of pushes people and pushes developers to not be able to pigeonhole, hey, this vulnerability doesn't match anything here, or hey, we're, we shouldn't look for anything else outside of this specific one phrase that they have. Um, so by having things like injection, um, you know, you can, what is injection, right? So it could be matching a whole bunch of different things. Security misconfiguration is actually one of the ones on the OWASP top 10. Um, so by having this increase of generality, um, it forces people to look more. So again, not gonna go through this, I'm not gonna read all these to you guys, because. I'm sure you guys have seen it before. Um, but again, yeah, using components with known vulnerabilities, a little vague, sensitive data exposure, definitely vague, could mean a, a lot of different things. Security misconfiguration, again. So, did some metrics for you guys. Um, this is kind of a sample set so that you can see exactly what vulnerabilities are looking like and what vulnerabilities look like as a as a actual, you know, practical example. And these are from all reports that were public, uh, provided from bug bounties, and um, some of them I took since you don't see any information, I took from some of the private listings that aren't publicly available. But again, these are all from programs that are, are out there. These are all actual vulnerabilities in public facing systems. So 839 of these were directly related to the OWASP top 10, non-vague, 100% OWASP top 10 fitting, right? So 30% of these vulnerabilities, easily preventable. I'll talk about why that is. But essentially, corporations paid one and a half million dollars for vulnerabilities that could have been pre prevented in a couple lines of code or by somebody actually looking at what they were doing and leveraging the resources that are already out there. So again, this is kind of a little chart, what it looks like. Naturally, cross-site scripting is the most um, prevalent. Um, and a lot of people you know, have, again, assessment fatigue and vulnerability fatigue. With, you, know, you see cross-site scripting all the time. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a severe vulnerability or that severe things can be done with it, right? 
So just because we see it, just because it's out there, just because it's always there, which it shouldn't be, but just because we see it a lot does not mean that it's, it's not you know, a vulnerability worth mentioning and worth focusing on. Uh, again, another way to look at it, um, and there's actually something on there that I want to highlight with you guys. Um, subdomain hijacking is something that is becoming much, much, much more prevalent, um, and it happens a lot. So if, anybody's, if no one is familiar with it or if anyone isn't familiar with subdomain hijacking, um, what happens is if there's a, either an IP address or a domain name that is pointed at a service um, but has not been registered or was registered and became unregistered or was claimed and became unclaimed, what happens is we can go in and attack that via claiming either the IP address or the domain, or the domain name depending on the service. Um, here's a list of services that are vulnerable. It's very prevalent, happens a lot. Um, one, I'll give you two examples. One very, very good example that was done um, was for a social media platform that um, involves taking selfies a lot. Um, I'm not gonna tell you guys specifically what it is, but um, <laughs> someone that I know, not me, but somebody, um, was able to submit a vulnerability around this. Um, they were able to hijack a suite or a set of subdomains um, that were involving a specific service for that, that um, social media platform, right? And what happened was, just to showcase the severity, sure, you can host whatever you want underneath those domains. You point them at your service, you can do whatever you want with them. But in this specific instance, clients that were not updated were still using these subdomains as something critical for that application, right? So checking for updates, pushing media, storing media, sending media, right? That could be problematic due to some of the usages of this application. Um, so yeah, subdomain hijacking can do a lot of things, right? Another one, um, this is from something that I submitted a while ago for Uber. Um, it's, the name is long, but the results were amazing. Um, so what happened with this was Uber had a process. It's a huge corporation. They have tons of developers. They had a process put into place for developers to quickly spin up AWS instances, do some development work, spin it down, right? So it's been up an AWS instance, give it a quick Uber domain, and spin it down once they were done. It's fantastic, it was great. Um, developers were using it a lot, obviously. Um, what ended up happening was the process for destroying those domain records was, it, was not being followed or was implemented incorrectly. Um, they wouldn't give me exactly what happened, um, but, but yeah, so that process wasn't being followed 100%. And what happened was, I ended up with around 40 to 50,000 Uber domains that either I controlled or somebody else controlled on accident. Um, so what happened with that was, um, because of them not claiming these domains, I was able to use any of the domains that I wanted and in addition to that, the reason that I found this initially was I think I was about 20 or 30 reports deep with Uber saying you have this site that is full of holes and they had said for the 20th time that we don't own this. And I was like, okay, something's up because you looks like you own it, right? So um, yeah, we ended up working with them to find, um, about, I think it was about 40 to 50,000 domains um, of theirs that were pointing elsewhere or that I could take. So yeah, so doing hijacking is huge. So again, 30% of these vulnerabilities, right? Easily preventable. The reason that these are easily preventable, again, is because of the tools that we have now. So if anybody in here is a dev, and even if you're not a dev, if you're doing red team, this is something you should keep in mind because knowing that it's this easy to prevent vulnerabilities means that when you see vulnerabilities occur, it's something is going wrong or someone is trying to do something that they shouldn't be doing, right? So all of these frameworks, super common, very, very common, have built-in protections for all these typical vulnerabilities that we see everywhere, right? There's no reason for us to be seeing this. The majority of the time that vulnerabilities occur is when someone goes, mm, I'll just write it myself. Nah, I don't wanna do that. Eh, we'll just add this on top of things, right? That's when we come along and we're like, great, add it, go ahead. So yeah, fantastic when we see custom code, depending on the side you're on, right? If you're working within a company and you see custom code and you're getting stressed out, like if someone's like, I'll write my own crypto library. You're usually like, mm, probably shouldn't. <laughs> Those kind of things happen, right? So yeah, but if you're on the outside and we're doing some hunting or you're you know, hired for an engagement and you see some custom code going up, make your adrenaline go up, might have some fun, right? But again, for those of you that are on Red Team, keep the mindset of don't be mean to the devs, right? It's not, it's not a relationship you wanna have like that. And I've actually gone into engagements and gone into situations where <coughs> corporations will say, oh, you're coming here to do this? Yeah, you're the, you're the guys we hate, right? Because we come in, we break stuff, we're like, hey, you guys are doing this incorrectly. That's not the relationship you want. You wanna have the relationship of, hey, we're here to help. We wanna make sure you guys' code better. We wanna make the things you're doing more secure. We wanna make sure that no one outside of us is destroying your applications, right? 
but we're gonna have fun while we do. So what's the excuse, right? And that's a question that I like to ask because it can sound very, very rude when you're like, what's the excuse for this? But it, honestly, there, there should be no reason for the majority of these vulnerabilities to be occurring. So lesson one we're gonna talk about is reinventing the wheel breaks the car, and I just actually touched on it a little bit. Um, I'm gonna show you why you know, doing things yourself or writing things on your own can you know, cause a lot of damage. So this vulnerability and this uh, situation was reported to some search engine. Um, there's a couple big ones out there. I'll let you guys pick which one you think it would be. Um, won't confirm even if you ask. But um, the target was a VOIP device that I, that I had found and the checklist items that it matches are right there. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all out, but. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through this process and showcase why um, you know, writing things on your own can be such an issue. So authentication was required for the main functionality. You know, they had credentials secure, group forcing wasn't a thing, HTTPS, okay, cool, rate limiting, great, ID blacklisting, even better. In-house software, so zero CVEs. Security through obscurity, but again, that means I can't go Google and find a quick, you know, RCE, whatever exploit, and just pop it in there and say, let's go. So authentication required for direct access. So, you know, bypassing that and trying to just request the URL, Nothing was working, I'm like, okay, let's see what else is there, right? Still doing things correctly, everything's good. We're gonna look. So, authentication was bypassed by accessing the non-standard functionality directly. So they had everything impl implemented, everything was great, everything was secure. Someone wrote a guest version of this that for some reason said administrative web session, but someone wrote a guest version of this, and if you look at the URL, we have that AWS WWW and that CGI bin. Just requesting the CGI bin gave us direct access to this guest functionality, which was written and after talking to the developers, was written as a testing thing for them to be able to go to and say, you know, we have these functions, we can show it to someone that's looking at this device personally, right? So it's great, great for us anyway. But we must go deeper, right? <laughs> so First thing that we notice is we have limited functionality, but we're able to see you know, some logs, right? We're able to view logs, and, and, and that's great, um, but there's only so much you can do with information, right? And with information disclosure of, of this caliber, anyway. So you can't really see the URL from there, so I'll bring it up a little closer. Um, should be some things that are like red flags immediately when you look at this, right? Um, if anyone's familiar with like Unix-based systems or Linux-based systems, um, it's common web directories or local directories anyway. So this plurtlog.cgi function is grabbing whatever it wants from this directory, right? I'm like, okay, naturally you're gonna see what can I grab with this, right? So again, looking at this right here. So function was able to be abused for a limited local file disclosure, right? So any of the log directories, I was able to access and read whatever I want, which is fantastic, right? Like nice vulnerability, feeling good already, like okay, let's go. Right? So I was able to see you know, some SQLite schema, some, some database information, read some binaries, whatever I wanted, but nothing that was like, I can't grab passwords, I can't do anything, you know, something, something spicy, right? So, like Bruce Lee, we're gonna keep going, okay? So, looking for the same functionality, right? Once you see something that has, you know, something done incorrectly, you're gonna wanna look around for something doing the same thing um, and that's, that's exactly what we did, right? And I say we because I'm used to writing reports from corporation side of things, I'm just talking about myself. Um, but yeah, so that's what we did, right? And what we were able to do is find this download.cgi functionality, which did the exact same thing in the exact same manner, but required more permissions, right? So I'm able to grab the password file, whatever else I wanted from that. That's great, right? Fantastic, file access is good, right? But we're gonna see what else is there, right? So mindset is, Two things, right? I'm hunting for something that is hard to do right, and it requires hard, high levels of permissions, rather. So if it's difficult for them to do, with the amount of custom code that I'm seeing, obviously it's gonna have some, some issues, right? So, a match was a firmware updating functionality that I found, and uh, essentially it accepted an image, moved it to the firmware directory via the queries preset command of move, right? So what it was doing was sending that move command to a shell script on the, on the back end, <coughs> and then was moving that image to where it needed to be, and then a cron job would come through and update the firmware. Great, hard to do right, requires direct system access, which is exactly what I'm looking for, right? So, functionality was located, payload here, um, my little complex, 
easiest way to put it is I want it to do everything that I want and nothing else, right? So knowing that it's a shell script on the back end, I was able to craft this, which essentially comments out portions of the shell script that was out there, um, runs my command, and does what I want. So it ran who am I and ID, right? Comes back with root. Great. It's a guest function, it's a guest script, it's a guest panel, and everything's running as root. So that's fantastic for us. So again, best route, only what we want. Try it again, craft another payload, grab the password file, can do whatever I want. So RCE. They patched this by making this device internally facing. So we'll talk again about why specifically this is a horrible idea if you don't already you know, have this in your mind as this is just not the right way to do things. Um, but this is something you'll see as a common fix in situations like this. Um, the corporation will just pull it inside and say, it's good, no one else can touch it. So, lesson number two, assume the worst, never the best. What I mean by that is don't trust the users ever, right? So don't ever trust anyone is going to be putting in things that you expect. And as a developer, you should never trust that your user is going to be competent and put in things. And I'm not saying that you have stupid users, but we're saying that stupid people exist and bad people exist. And some bad people like to do bad things with your applications, right? So this one builder is reported to some retailer um, the target was an automation platform that some of you may know, um, and these are the checklists that it kind of goes off, right? And um, I'm gonna say lesson number two is how to lose a few billion dollars in two easy steps. Um, this corporation is worth uh, billions and billions of dollars. It's a very large corporation. Um, one bit of you know, overlooking something or assuming, uh, making some you know, negative or detrimental assumptions um, can lead you to losing a lot, a lot of money, right? So assuming internal only applications require less scrutiny, that's one assumption, and assuming that internal only will always be internal only. So like I said, pulling that application in as a patch for the first, for the first vulnerability we just discussed is a horrible way to fix something. And the reason that that's a horrible way to fix something is because in the event that that application is ever exposed, it's completely free, right? Again, all over again. And on top of that, if I'm able to exploit something else to access that network, that means that application is gonna be another pivot point for Right? So, Jenkins. If anybody's familiar with Jenkins, um, it's used for a lot of different things, mostly automation, some code, uh, code review, some backup management, a lot of different things it can do, right? It's pretty powerful, it's great, um, when done correctly. So we come to the Jenkins panel, and you'll see a kind of a theme with these sorts of things. Um, credentials are secure, HTTPS, rate limiting, blacklisting, great, 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 great. Authentication bypass by manual browsing. The way they had it set up was, we want auth for everything that you touch as long as you touch what we expect you to touch. So manually requesting the directories beneath, or manually requesting the management functionality gave me access to the box. I'm like, okay, cool. Limited functionality, right? But I have access to some things. So limited access to corporation-wide backups, as in I can see them, but I can't really take them. So great, I'm like, okay, I know this is a lot of information I shouldn't have. Um, domain lists of the entire corporation, so if I wanted to start hitting everything else, I could have done so. Um, that is one thing that I will mention for those of you that are interested in bug bounties. Do not scope creep, especially with corporations that could buy you and your family hundreds of times over. Don't do it. There's been situations where I know someone, Facebook bragged about, you know, we'll pay out for a million dollar bounty. Um, someone found what I would have said was a million dollar bounty. Um, but he compromised one device on Facebook's network, which was great, fantastic job, well done. But he was like, okay, you know, what else could I do with this? Stole the credentials of the SSH agent of a developer that was logged in, pivoted to one of their AWS boxes, got onto that, stole their AWS keys, and started hopping around Facebook boxes. That's not the way to go. So Facebook was naturally a little angry about this. Um, he did not get a million dollars, um, but he got like $8,000, but at the same time he didn't go to jail. So, you know, when some lose some. But again, so we had limited access to the backups, but wanted to go, wanted to go a little bit deeper. If you guys didn't see on that main page, there was an issue, um, and I noticed that, and you say, you know, what is this? And this was before, now there's tons of write-ups for Jenkins vulnerabilities. This was before that was um, kind of the case. So this was new to me, I was like pretty excited. Um, hadn't seen any, you know, publicly, uh, like, you know, published exploits for some of these. <clears throat> but now there's some pretty detailed write-ups about some of these vulnerabilities. But um, so it says reverse proxy setup is broken. Now, what does that mean, right? So in Jenkins documentation, it specifically says, make sure that you change the listening address from 0.0.0.0 to 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 127, right? 
Otherwise, any Apache level restriction can be easily bypassed. Now what does that mean, right? By directly accessing and directly requesting that Jenkins port, any permission, any authentication that's built in that's Apache specific will be bypassed. And that's what we saw happening here. So it's great, had access, let's go further. So Jenkins Script Console. Jenkins features a nice Groovy Script Console that allows developers to go in, you're allowed to write some code, you can do some things, you know, fantastic. You can automate some stuff, quickly do it. Fantastic, great, 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 great. <coughs> now, Jenkins, in their documentation, and this is paraphrased, but in their documentation literally says, the developer console can do anything Java can do, offers no administrative controls, as in, no, you cannot restrict this, can configure anything, and, well, it was meant for devs. Fine, I'll take it. So, what happened was, end goal, I wanted RCE, I wanted control of this box, I wanted to be ex uh, able to access and execute commands at my leisure, right? Um, default for that insecure API implementation, you can secure it, but again, any kind of uh, built-in security that is uh, you know, misconfigured with this, if it's not internal, I can access, and if they have it misconfigured, there's no authentication, right? So, these are two little groovy scripts that you create, and that I created, for one to download, and the other one to execute, right? So the first script downloads something from my server, it tells and reaches out to that groovy API that developers use, and says, hey, I need to grab this script from somewhere else, so that I can do some stuff. It goes out, grabs it, downloads it. The script is a reverse connecting shell, so what it does is it connects to my server, right? And then the second one executes that, right? Great. So, this is the commands that we're using for that. Um, the second command is just setting up a netcat listener. I'm sure a lot of you have done this before. Um, by doing that and executing that script, I was like, let's see if it actually works, see if it runs. Did it. So the Jenkins server connected to me, gave me access to the Jenkins user, and I had control over the server, right? Which meant I had access to all those backups for the entire corporation. So I could download those, I could modify those, I could go into the database, and since they're doing millions and millions of dollars in transactions every day, I could take some. So, good stuff. What happened here though, right? We saw misconfiguration that allowed authentication to be bypassed completely, and the assumption that because they had this set up to be internal only, it would be internal only. But since it was misconfigured, it was accessible publicly. So what happens here is they probably knew that this API, and actually after talking to them, they knew that this API was insecure. They knew the Jenkins box could be compromised. But their configuration said it's supposed to be local only. So they assumed it was fine. It wasn't. It went public. It was actually only up in public after they checked logs. I think it was up for about 45 minutes. So definitely I was lucky in finding this. Um, but the fact is it could have been anybody, right? And allowing someone to have access to backups for your entire corporation, even for 45 minutes, would have been plenty of time to do whatever I wanted. So this was patched by, making it internally facing. So after that huge fiasco of them discussing, you know, well, we know it's vulnerable, it's supposed to be internal only, blah, 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 they still just fixed it by making it internal only. Is yeah. that because they think they like might want to use it later? So they're well, the, the issue isn't that they want to use the application. The issue is they didn't fix the vulnerability, right? Yeah, but, but turning it internally instead of instead of doing something else, is that is because that they don't have the time or because they might want to use it again? Um, I mean, they're still using it. They're still using it. Yeah, they're still using the application. It, it, it didn't need to be publicly accessible was okay. the issue, right? Okay. So it, no one on the external internet needed to see this. If you had to connect to a corporate VPN and get to it, fine, that's great. Um, you can access it from the internal network, but that was that was what they were doing. And so were, the, they, were, were the Uber subdomains still in use, or were those old? Um, no, none of them were still being used by Uber. So it was 40 to 40, 40 to 50,000 subdomains yeah. that were just, they thought were gone okay. and weren't. So yeah, so leveraging Uber's name to do whatever you wanted kind of thing. So yeah, that was essentially my phase when they did that. Um, <laughs> lesson number three, uh, just because it's expensive doesn't make it secure. There's a really, really negative um, mindset that people have in these types of corporations, which is, I mean, we bought it, so it's got to be secure. I mean, that corporation's using it, so it's got to be secure. Or we paid this contractor hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to make it, so they had to make it right. No. None of these situations allow you to just completely bypass your normal checks and balances of, you know, this is a new application, this is a new service, this is something we need to evaluate, this is something we need to, you know, have some, some scrutiny on, um, but it's done all too often. So, this one was reported to some three-letter organization. 
Um, so this one will be a little bit more sanitized than, than the other ones. Um, but yeah, it was uh, one of the three letter organizations that we have here. Um, it was a data analysis tool and mapping device. Um, and I give as much information as I can because it's a great example for um, um, showing you know, what happens when everything's done correctly and securely and then you add one thing on top that just destroys everything, right? So, um, disclaimer. All right, so this is what we see, right? We get a, a login page. This is the only piece of the application we're allowed to see, only piece we're allowed to access. This is it. So what do we see, right? Credentials are secure. Can't brute force it because there's rate limiting, right? IP blacklisting, geo IP blacklisting, manual account creation. And by manual account creation, I mean I can't go register for this. I fill out the application, send it out. Someone manually looks at it, calls me up, gives me an access key providing I'm such and such from such and such three letter organization and gives me my login but that way, right? So there's no way I'm getting a login because I'm not any of these things. So the one thing that we see is on the page there's a little bit of a, um, so I said it's a data analysis tool slash mapping functionality, right? In the corner of the page underneath the login screen there's like a little sample window um, showing what it's supposed to do and essentially it's like a little map, right? So that's all it was and it was like a little proof of concept of what the tool actually allows the people that have access to it to do, right? So naturally, whenever you're doing testing, you're running everything through a proxy, you're looking at the requests, you're looking at everything the website's doing, this is what comes up. So we see a couple of requests going out, requesting something that is in JSON format, pulling that data back in, and presumably creating the map, right? So again, what do we see? We see URL being passed, we see it's reaching out remotely, and we see there's an output format variable. So, Client specifiable URL, JSON. So, create a listener. What I'm gonna check now is, um, and this is something that you always wanna check is, uh, do they have a whitelist? You know, is there a limit, or are they only allowing this application to call out to you know, site A or site B, right? Something they should be doing, providing they have GOIP blacklisting, manual account creation, you know, like this has gotta be secure, right? No. <laughs> So putting in whatever website you want, putting in my IP address for my server, it goes, mm, sure, I'll grab whatever data you want from there, right? So we'll see what we can do. Set up the listener, malicious data point, set up a website, set up a little malicious little HTML doc on my site, and then remove the client specified protection. So what it was doing was that JSON, they were like, well, if we pass it JSON, it'll only pull in in JSON format, it won't render anything, just removed it. And it was like, okay. So, I did whatever I wanted, pulled in my site. I was like, I wonder if it'll do some more. It would. You give it a directory listing, it pulls it in, populates the site, downloads the files, listen. So, this was supposed to only be for pulling in JSON mapping data and putting it into a little map, right? Now it's being exploited. So that's great, but again, gotta do some more stuff, right? It's fantastic. So you're not seeing anything, right? That's all we saw was this, this login page. That's it. There was no other functionality. The only thing that was calling out was that had limited exploitability. I could, you know, do some nasty stuff with it, but I don't have control over this box, right? And you remember how I said earlier that, you know, cross-site scripting is cross-site scripting. Everybody's like, mm, yeah, you make a little alert box. We can take somebody's cookies, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but in some situations, we can do some really, really fun stuff with it, right? So. Limited functionality, we don't see anything, so we're gonna start hitting the URIs, right? So we're gonna start looking for subdirectories, you're gonna start looking for you know, some weird functionality that has to do with this, the web server or the code um, that's actually going on underneath, right? So, when I was doing this, and I was looking through and trying to you know, make it do some weird stuff, it's really what we do is we poke until something breaks. Um, you see, normal response is gonna be that 403, you know, forbidden, you're not allowed, allowed to access this, 500 is gonna be that server error, and hopefully give us some juice, right? So, got one. Um, when I passed in that dash dash, you know, greater than, right? So we got some weird error, right? An error occurred while processing this directive. Now, when I saw this, I was like, mm, there's no way. First, it's a three letter. They have GOIP blacklisting. They've got manual account creation. It's really secure. They've been doing stuff well. Albeit, they did have that one little thing. But there's no way, right? So no one, if you haven't seen this error before, it's probably because it hasn't really been around for a long time, or well, hasn't it has been along for a long time, but it's not very popular anymore, right? So this is SSI, 
right? For those of you that aren't familiar with SSI, which you probably won't be because there's probably no reason for you to be because nobody really uses it anymore. Uh, Crash Course SSI Service Side includes, it essentially allows you to do what PHP lets you do, right? So that inline PHP, you can write server code in an HTML document or a PHP document, right? And just put it in there inline and do some cool stuff to, on the server end, right? Same thing, but this allows you to do it in the HTML documents. Okay. Can we see how cross-site scripting would come into handy with something like this, right? So the entire path and the, the root directory is taking the specified path into an SSI command on the back end and doing something with it. So by me passing in that dash dash and the greater than, it was wrecking that script or whatever it was trying to run, the SSI was grabbing it in and trying to execute that dash dash greater than. So, limitations. Like I said, we don't, scrape on, we don't scope creep on billion dollar corporations because they'll end you, and we don't scrape, scope creep on three letter organizations because they will literally end you, right? So these types of organizations, when they allow you to do a bug bounty, when they allow you to assess an application that they have, we don't touch it, right? So they say no sensitive pulls, right? So even if you can wreck anything you want, even if you can pull their whole database out, you pull maybe two characters just to prove it, right? That's all you do. Or you, in certain circumstances, I've had situations where I'm not allowed to test if the vulnerability is valid. I'm allowed to tell them that I think that I can do this and they'll test it. So in this circumstance, I was able to actually test it, um, thankfully, but I was not allowed to pull any sensitive data. So, again, I wanted to only do what I want. This is a payload that we ended up with. It's nasty looking, um, but this is what ended up happening, right? So, um, commenting out everything before, um, a couple of SSI commands that they had in the, that was trying to parse them in the back end. Um, in addition to that, I'm injecting my own SSI command, setting two variables, like you can see there, set one variable, two variable, actually four. Um, but anyway, yeah, setting those variables and then echoing them out, right? To see whether or not it's actually going to pull it in on the back end and echo out what I want. So, it failed, it echoed, which means that we had control over three little organizations, private testing, data and out analytics tool, um, which was great. My adrenaline was pumping, I was hyped, and I was kind of scared, but it was great. So these are the kinds of things that can happen. So after talking to them a little bit, what happened was, and with the private bug bounties and with the bug bounties where you're working personally with another corporation, and even if it's a three letter, um, you get direct access, right? So it's a direct channel where you're having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, and you can talk to them. You can ask them, hey, you know, I'm curious, like, what the heck were you doing, right? And you ask in a much, much more polite way, but you ask it, right? So about talking with them, um, essentially what happened was they hired a contractor to create a quick POC for the homepage for what that tool did. He did, and in doing so, developed that first vulnerability and the second vulnerability. So the first vulnerability was there because he created his POC just completely insecurely, right? The second one was because he had used SSI to create that and had configured that incorrectly. So their entire application was very secure, hired a contractor, didn't double check his work because they paid him a lot, and this was the result. So reinventing the wheel breaks the car. Use your resources. That's what I mean by that. Don't do things on your own that you don't have to. And I know a lot of the times you're like, you know, I want to write it myself. Like, I want to learn. That's great. It's a great mindset. It's fantastic. But at the same time, when you're going to, you know, implement things that are security based, the odds of you creating your own version that is more secure than the version that has been reviewed by everyone at OWASP for hundreds and hundreds of developers over the last five years, it's not going to happen. And maybe it will. Maybe you're a savant. But at the same time, statistically, probably not. So just leverage the things that are there. Two, assume the worst, never the best. Prepare for everything. So again, don't trust the users. Don't assume that something's always gonna be internal just because it's internal now. And even if it is internal, that's not okay. Don't assume that no one's ever gonna be able to pop any box to get onto your network. Because if I do, and you've left everything open on the inside, that's great. Three, just because it's expensive, doesn't make it secure, super self-explanatory. Just because you bought it, don't trust it automatically. Don't trust reviews, don't be blind and be like, you know, I mean, he's using it, he said it's good. Make sure you check. Verify, run it through your standard processes. And I'm saying this to you guys, a lot of you like aren't in situations where this is directly applicable, but when you go to work for a corporation or if you're doing dev work on the side or if, you're, or if you end up on a security team, red team, blue team, 
this should be something that you keep in the back of your mind where, you know, if someone's like, oh, we just bought this app, we're implementing it. It's like, did anyone do an evaluation? Did anyone do a check? Did anyone check out the security of this? Did anyone actually look? So, bug bounties, evolution of the landscape. Now, I'm gonna sound very negative when I describe this, and I, I mean it, and it's coming from actual experience. Um, bug bounties are great. So when I was, you know, much, much younger, um, I would get emails and mail, literally physical mail, from corporations, lawyers, and things like that, that would say, hey, we uh, don't want you touching our things, right? And it's usually because I would send out an email being like, hey, I like your site, but I can do this. I'm trying to help, right? I'm trying to be nice. They don't, they don't like it. They don't like that, right? So I would get email from lawyers saying cease and desist. It didn't matter that you were 11 or 12, whatever. You would get these kind of things in the mail. Um, so that's, that's kind of what the landscape was like, right? It, was, it, was, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Don't touch our things because we don't want anybody hacking into them. Now, that made sense to them then. And now people are realizing people don't care if you say don't touch things. If it's open, it's open. Someone will steal your things, right? So now bug bunnies are providing an outlet for people that were doing you know, bad things or were tempted to do bad things to actually do bad things for a good reason and get compensated for it, um, which is great. The issue that I see arising in bug bounties, and as I've you know, been doing these for a couple of years now, um, the issue that comes up more and more and more often is underpaying and corporations attempting to get out of things, right? So if a corporation can say, you know, sure that vulnerability is there, but we don't want to pay for that. There's very little we can do being, you know, I'm just one researcher. I can't, sure, you can go to Twitter and be like, oh, like they don't pay for this, blah, blah, blah. Sure, then you're blacklisted. Then no other company wants you. Nobody else wants to put you on their program, and now you're that guy, right? So that's an issue. The underpaying situation removes that incentive and removes that disincentivization that it, you know bug bounties are supposed to be providing. And if I if I give you a vulnerability that's worth ten thousand dollars and I know I can sell it to some Russian guys for ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars, and you're like, mm, here's ten bucks. That's gonna make me want to go to Payspin, put it up there, and watch everything burn, right? So that's that's really what happens, and that's and that's something that I, I see a lot, and it's corporations that are, you know, not understanding the, the cost savings that they're getting by having access to these researchers, and just because a couple of people find some severe vulnerabilities and they have to pay out a little bit more, they're not understanding that the other side to that is, A, I could just use the vulnerability and steal, I could sell the vulnerability and steal, or I could paste the vulnerability somewhere public and short your stock. So there's a lot of things that, you, that can be done with this that corporations aren't 100% understanding. And I'm seeing a growing change in the bug bounty community of people getting more and more you know, upset with the things that are happening and more and more you know, pushed back towards that you know, black hat side of things. And that's not what this is supposed to be. So for those of you that are getting involved or tempted to get involved in bug bounties or want to get involved in bug bounties, um, the two main things that I can say are have patience, be persistent, and don't be afraid to stick up for yourself. And when I say that is, it's not, it's if they pay you not to be like, hey, this is worth more than that, it's not gonna work. That's not gonna happen. What I mean by that is, if they pay you and you're not satisfied with the result, contact them directly and ask them why. Get their reasoning, get exactly what they mean, what they're looking for, why this has been paid out this much. And before you even start the program, make sure you check. Check the payouts, check the scope. If their payouts are 10 to $100, don't expect more than that. If their scope is website A, website B, and you submit a vulnerability for website D, and they wreck your reputation and are saying, you know, this is out of scope, why are we even touching this? Don't be surprised. So make sure you know what you're doing, make sure you know what you're attacking. But again, contact them directly, talk to them, figure out what was what went wrong. And again, if something does go, you know, that's why these middlemen come in handy, because you can actually stick up for yourself using them. You can say, hey, I don't really know what went on with this. They'll stick up for you so that you don't have to, you know, put your reputation on the line like that. Um, I didn't really discuss this, but a lot of companies um, still run their bug bounty programs on their own, um, which can be public, can be private, can be semi-private, um, and they don't use a middleman at all. Um, a couple of these companies, like United Airlines, they do this as well. Um, but a lot of the times, you'll see situations where these private and you know non-middleman-based bug bounties can do whatever they want, right? So if there's no one between me and the company, and I submit a vulnerability to the company, the company can go, we don't pay out for that, and fix it, 
right? So they can do that. So that's another thing that you need to be aware of and need to be conscious of where you're making sure you're documenting everything that you're doing so that if they do attempt to do something like that, you can come back and say, hey, I submitted this an hour ago. It's fixed now. You said it's not worth anything. That's questionable, right? So yeah, but bug bounties are great. They allow you to you know, have an actual outlet for testing these sorts of things. They allow you to have uh, actual examples and do actual you know, assessments without risk of jail, and albeit that does decrease the adrenaline rush from what it should be when you know you're attacking something that you know you definitely shouldn't be. But it's great, and uh, jail is not the way to go. So <laughs> it's fantastic. But yeah, that's it for me, guys. Yeah. Any questions? So as a developer, aside from using you know, standard framework with built-in security, uh, what other things can we do to help security or try or test for security vulnerabilities or so? Yeah, um, so one thing that I would definitely recommend is in addition to you know, using frameworks and things like that, would be to, like I said, have that mindset of distrust. So writing your application and making sure that it works fantastic and quick and responsive for people is, is well and good. But again, if you're writing with the mindset of someone's gonna put some stuff in here that I don't want, how can I stop that? That's honestly, more often than not, that will fix the majority of vulnerabilities. Now, when you have that mindset, then you're able to go to OWASP or go to you know something else and look at code snippets that will back up those specific claims. Like, we don't want any of this kind of input, and it'll show you how to do that. Um, simple ways to do, like parameterized queries for taking SQL statements, things like that, that will prevent SQL injection, things like that. It'll show you in every language how it's done, how it should be done. Um, tons and tons of good resources. So, yeah. Anybody else? So, uh, on those three specific examples, what was like the time frame for you to go through each stuff? Because when you go through the PowerPoint, it makes yeah. it seem very easy. So. Oh, yeah. Um, honestly, um, I would say for the VOIP device, that one was probably two days. Um, so probably like six hours, six, seven hours. Um, because once I was in, it was, it was kind of you know, finding the additional things to exploit. Um, and the main, the main process is, is writing it up, right? So, so writing everything up in a coherent, um, high quality way, and you have to write it in a way that everyone will understand. So you can't write you know, massive amounts of technical information with no, no brief you know, overhead, because the people that are managing the vulnerability after you submit it might not necessarily be highly technical. And, and in certain circumstances, I've had people go, uh, we don't know what this is, this isn't a vulnerability, and send it back. So, um, so yeah, it takes time. The majority of the time is finding something, right? So finding something or finding something that you are interested in enough or that looks interesting enough to you to actually go after like that. Um, so that can be hours, and then the actual testing can take like you know much less time. But um, I'll say average time for, for each of those is probably about four hours. So, yeah. You generally pro yeah. So I'll let him go. Now come right back. Yeah. Um, how much competition do you see uh, with these types of bounty programs in terms of like? Um, People beating you to things? Yeah, the people beating you to things. Huge, much. huge. I think uh, if I if I say let's for the sake of rounding numbers, say I've submitted 400 vulnerabilities. Yeah. 180 at least are duplicates, which means somebody else beat me to it, but they didn't patch it yet. So yeah, it happens a lot, and it drives you nuts. Because say you spent six hours, you're like, oh, let's go. You find it, write it up. It's beautiful. You got little screenshots, you know, little Wireshark snippets. You're like, let's go. Mm -hmm. Got it formatted, marked down, it's pretty. And they're like, somebody submitted that an hour and a half ago. You're like, what? Yeah, happens. Definitely happens. It happens a lot, actually. So, and that's what you'll notice between like public and private. Um, and you honestly think that it would happen less in private, more in public, and that's not the case. Because the guys that are in private are dedicated, they're usually doing it because they know what they're doing and they've made it that far. So you have, instead of like 10,000 people where 1,000 people know what they're doing, you have a thousand guys, and they all know exactly what they're doing, and they're all attacking the same application. So, yeah, duplicates are huge, and it's, I'm pretty sure my first like twenty submissions were all duplicates, which almost made me not even touch bug bounties again. So, yeah. Yes. And so, just going off of that, like, how do, do you prefer doing private versus public? What kind of um, programs? It depends on the corporation, right? So, there's some public bounties that are freaking awesome. Um, which makes them more competitive. Um, like if the corporation is super responsive, if they're great, if they're friendly, I love it. Like Uber, great relationship. I actually know some of the guys that work there, so, and same with, uh, actually Netflix has one. 
Um, but yeah, some of the guys that work there work with me at other companies, and they'll get one of my submissions and be like, they'll, I'll get a text and be like, like, oh yeah, if you think you're good or something like that, and I'm like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, you know, you have like a full report, so that's fantastic. Um, private ones will tend to pay out much quicker, usually in like a day or 48 hours. Other ones I've had, uh, I think my top one is a year and a half um, without it being patched and or paid. Um, and then I, I have some pending right now that are nine months old. So, and by some, I mean like 30. So like, yeah, yeah, so that it can happen. Where private ones, you're more guaranteed to get paid if you find anything, but it's much more difficult to find something. Public, um, you'll get paid, but who knows when. Um, so yeah, varies for sure. Anything else? No? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you.